Hello guys and welcome back. In this video I'm going to talk about the pulmonary arterial systolic pressure. Thank you for watching, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. So let's start. First, let's talk about pulmonary hypertension. I'm going to talk about this very briefly, but if you want more information, I have a video about this in my YouTube channel and I will leave the link in the description. Pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean arterial pressure of 25 millimeters of mercury as confirmed on right heart catheterization. Traditionally, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure has been estimated on echo by utilizing the simplified Bernoulli equation from the peak tricuspid regurgitant velocity and adding this to an estimate of right atrial pressure. Previous studies have demonstrated a correlation between this estimate of pulmonary arterial systolic pressure and that obtained from invasive measurement across a cohort of patients. However, for an individual patient, significant overestimation and underestimation can occur, and the levels of agreement between the two is poor. Recent guidance has suggested that echocardiographic assessment of pulmonary hypertension should be limited to determining the probability of pulmonary hypertension being present rather than estimating the pulmonary artery pressure. In those patients in whom the presence of pulmonary hypertension requires confirmation, this should be done with right heart catheterization when indicated. Now let's talk about the right ventricular systolic pressure and echocardiography. The gold standard way of obtaining the right ventricular systolic pressure and the pulmonary artery pressure is right heart catheterization, which is an invasive procedure. Echocardiography can be used to estimate the right ventricular systolic pressure and importantly provides a non-invasive way of doing so. Echocardiography is therefore an excellent way of identifying people with elevated right ventricular systolic pressure and pulmonary hypertension, and therefore selecting those candidates that may benefit from treatment and sometimes confirmation of the diagnosis with right heart catheterization. It's very important to remember that echocardiography is not an exact science and there are many limitations to measurements obtained. Also, multiple numbers such as right ventricular systolic pressure are being put into formulas, so any errors will be greater multiplied. For this reason, Conclusions from echocardiography should be limited to classifying patients as having a certain probability of having pulmonary hypertension rather than making a certain diagnosis. Also, it's important that the right ventricular systolic pressure value is not taken in isolation when suggesting a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. Rather, multiple supporting echocardiographic findings should be taken together. So, what is pulmonary artery systolic pressure and what is right ventricular systolic pressure? The pulmonary arterial systolic pressure is equivalent to right ventricular systolic pressure in the absence of pulmonary outflow obstruction, like pulmonary stenosis. So we can say, in absence of obstruction, 
the right ventricular systolic pressure is equivalent to the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. RVSP is short for right ventricular systolic pressure and it is found on almost all echocardiogram reports. It is important as the right ventricular systolic pressure is used to estimate the pressure inside the artery that supplies the lung with blood. In most cases, the right ventricular systolic pressure equals the pulmonary artery pressure. Elevated pressures in the pulmonary artery is known as pulmonary hypertension, a condition that may require close attention and treatment. The right ventricular systolic pressure basically is the pressure generated by the right side of the heart when it pumps. The right side of the heart has to pump into the lungs through a vessel called the pulmonary artery. The higher the pressure in the pulmonary artery, the higher the pressure the right heart has to generate which basically means the higher the right ventricular systolic pressure. When the right side of the heart pumps, most people have a little leak back through the right-sided heart valve known as the tricuspid valve. The pressure generated by the right side is reflected in measurements of this leak. The leak is known as tricuspid regurgitation and the measurement that is important is the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. So, the velocity across the tricuspid valve is proportional to the right ventricular systolic pressure. This measurement is placed into a formula and an estimate of the right ventricular systolic pressure is obtained, which also reflects the pulmonary artery pressure. The formula also requires a measurement of the right atrial pressure, which is estimated by looking at the size of the inferior vena cava on the echocardiogram. The right ventricular systolic pressure is important because it allows estimation of the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Therefore, on the echo report, the more important measurement is the estimated pulmonary artery systolic pressure. And the number given estimates the pressure in units of millimeters of mercury. Now, how to estimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure? Traditionally, the pulmonary artery systolic pressure has been estimated on echo by utilizing the simplified Bernoulli equation. The pulmonary artery systolic pressure is estimated by measurement of the systolic regurgitant tricuspid flow velocity and an estimate of right atrial pressure. This is the formula you need to apply to obtain the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. You only need two things. First, you need the tricuspid regurgitation peak velocity and second, you need the right atrial pressure. With only these two things and by applying the formula, you will be able to obtain the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. So how can we find these two elements of this formula? Let's start first with the tricuspid regurgitation velocity. The peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity is measured by continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid valve. Multiple views may need to be taken to obtain the optimal window. These include the right ventricular inflow view, 
the parasternal short axis view, the apical four chamber view, subcostal view, or a modified view between the short axis and the four chamber views. Always ensure the continuous wave Doppler to flow angle is correctly aligned. Eccentric jets can lead to incomplete Doppler envelopes and underestimation of tricuspid regurgitation velocity. Using a high sweep speed can help to differentiate between true velocities and artifacts. Tricuspid regurgitation velocity can be underestimated in severe or free flow tricuspid regurgitation and should be stated in the report if present. Always measure from a complete tricuspid regurgitation envelope. Choose always the highest velocity or the average of 5 bits in atrial fibrillation. A tricuspid regurgitation velocity less than 2.8 meters per second is considered normal and indicates a low probability of pulmonary hypertension if other markers of pulmonary hypertension are absent. The peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity is the key parameter in determining the probability of pulmonary hypertension, but the tricuspid regurgitation signal can be absent in a portion of patients. If the tricuspid regurgitation signal is absent, probability estimation should be based on clinical context taking into consideration other concordant clinical and echocardiographic signs of right ventricular pressure overload. In patients with a trivial tricuspid regurgitation jet or suboptimal continuous wave Doppler spectrum, Injection of intravenous agitated silane can be considered to improve the Doppler signal, allowing measurement of peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity. As a default, if clinical suspicion remains, invasive measurement of pulmonary pressures should be recommended. The second parameter we need is the right atrial pressure. The right atrial pressure is estimated from a variety of surrogate markers, like the inferior vena cava size and sniff variation, the right atrial size, and the hepatic vein flow. Traditionally, the right atrial pressure estimate is added to the pressure gradient across the tricuspid valve to derive an estimated pulmonary artery pressure. So, you always need to check and measure the inferior vena cava size and inspiratory collapse. This is important because through this we can estimate the right atrial pressure to define the right ventricular and systolic pressure. If the inferior vena cava diameter is more than 21 mm with decreased inspiratory collapse, is considered abnormal. We can also assess some other structures in order to estimate the right atrial pressure. For example, the right atrial size. The right atrial pressure is raised when the right atrium size is dilated. A normal right atrial area is less than 22 cm square for males and less than 19 cm square for females. Also, you can check the hepatic vein flow. The right atrial pressure is raised when you find systolic reversal flow in the hepatic vein flow. This is how you can estimate the right atrial pressure and get a number. If the inferior vena cava is normal size with an inspiratory collapse more than 
the right atrial pressure is less than 5 millimeters of mercury. Now, if the inferior vena cava is still normal size, but now you notice that the inspiratory collapse is less than 50%, the estimated right atrial pressure is now between 5 and 10 millimeters of mercury. And if the inferior vena cava is dilated with an inspiratory collapse less than 50%, the estimated right atrial pressure is more than 15 millimeters of mercury. So it's very simple, with just three steps you are going to be able to obtain the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. First, obtain the peak tricuspid velocity with continuous wave Doppler across the tricuspid valve. In this case, the tricuspid regurgitation velocity is 2.3 meters per second. The second step is to estimate the right atrial pressure by the assessment of the inferior vena cava size and inspiratory collapse. In this case, the inferior vena cava is normal size with an inspiratory collapse more than 50%. So your estimated right atrial pressure is going to be 5 millimeters of mercury. The step number three is just applying the formula using the Bernoulli equation to estimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. In this case, we got a pulmonary artery systolic pressure of 26 millimeters of mercury. So it's very simple to estimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure with just these three simple steps. Also, always remember to take into consideration some other measurements like the right atrial size and the hepatic veins flow. And to finish, Let's talk about some common pitfalls. Number one, a lesser degree of tricuspid regurgitation may occur in a compensated right ventricle. And this could lead to underestimation of the pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Number two, severe tricuspid regurgitation could cause equalization of right atrial and ventricular pressures which may cause the tricuspid regurgitation doppler envelope to be cut short leading to underestimation of the pulmonary artery systolic pressure number three the rate atrial pressure is often overestimated if the inferior vena cava measurement is used, leading to overestimation of pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Number four, calculations using the tricuspid regurgitation trace assume that there is no pulmonary valve stenosis and may be inaccurate in the presence of right ventricular systolic dysfunction. And number five, the tricuspid regurgitation signal could be poor in a good proportion of patients with lung disease, and tricuspid regurgitation measurement should be avoided in absence of a good Doppler envelope. Thank you for watching and don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel. See you on another video. Bye!